Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Alessandro from Dardash. Um, and uh, I'm a little bit of a late bloomer when it comes to databases. Um, I probably have a different career than most of you. Um, I did study a little bit of SQL back in school, but then for the first 15 years on the job, I didn't have any chance to play with it, and I forgot most of it. Um, the most fun I had in those 15 years was building the data path for distributed virtual network appliances. That's a little bit of a bountiful, but as you may notice, nothing in that word salad has anything to do with databases. So I was a little bit in the dark, and I thought databases were really boring. And boy, was I mistaken. <laughs> then five years ago, I joined a food delivery startup, DoorDash. And shortly after I joined, I realized that DoorDash had a tradition of throwing a surprise party at a random time leading to our weekly peak on Fridays. Typically, our main database would crash and burn, leading to potentially hours of downtime. And every engineer at the company would stop what they were doing to try and help to get our systems back. Um, that's when I realized that databases could be very interesting. It's also where I had a quick thought. Uh, what should I do about this? <laughs> should I go back to my previous employer, say, I'm so sorry I hurt your feelings. Would you take me back? Or should I roll up my sleeves and try and do something about this situation? Originally, DoorDash was built around a, a Django monolith talking to a single database cluster. That single database cluster was using a technology that offered a single writer. Um, by the time I joined, uh, the situation had already somewhat improved. Um, a few handful microservices had been cut out of the monolith, and a few database clusters had been added. But their destiny was already written. Going through our exponential growth, very soon they also would have been in the same spot as our main databases. We needed to do something. We needed to deal with this in a very quick and responsive way while not blocking any progress in the active breaking up of the monolith. So we engaged in a lot of whack-a-mole chasing issues um, all over the place. Luckily, the monolith was offering us a single vantage point whereby monkey patching the ORM, we would be able to gain very precious insights onto the kind of abuse that the application was imposing upon our databases. Uh, but these would go away really quickly as we would uh, break up the monolith. Clearly, our biggest enemy was the single primary architecture of our database. And our North Star would have been to move to a solution that offered multiple writers. These had already been going on in a poor man kind of fashion by means of vertical federation of tables such that different tables would be able to get their own single writer and therefore scale another little bit and allow us to keep the lights on for a little bit longer. But we needed to take steps towards limitless horizontal scalability. And Cockroach seemed like the right answer. Um, on Friday the 17th um, of uh, April 2020, we had a huge wake-up call. As you may remember, the country was in lockdown, so people weren't able to dine at restaurants, and everybody was ordering food online. We were the main source of revenue for restaurant owners. On that Friday, our main database cluster peaked at 1.6 million QPSs. It crashed and burned, and we went down for a couple of hours. Because of the spillover traffic 
from DoorDash consumers that were still hungry, our two main competitors also went down. <laughs> so put yourself in the shoes of a poor restaurant owner that is really worried about the future with all the uncertainty stemming from the entire situation. They didn't have any walk-ins, any on-premise business, and they didn't have any online orders either. They took their frustration to social media, and I reached out to a dear friend of mine that owns one of the first three partner restaurants that DoorDash ever enrolled on the platform. And uh, I'm not sure you are fluent in Italian, but I guess you're all fluent in the universal language of love and other emotions that are often expressed through the use of emojis. Um, so, again, leveraging um, escape patches that we had, with a lot of wisdom, put into the core of the ORM, and through other hacks deep down in the guts of the Django ORM, we managed to gain some extra headroom in the very short term, and then we quickly put together a prototype to speed up table extractions and be able to perform several of them back to back. We used as a guinea pig perhaps the most critical table we had, the identity table. If that doesn't work, no consumer, no merchant, no dasher would be able to log in onto our website or our mobile apps. The rule of the game was to be able to revert back our extraction to the previous source of truth if anything didn't go as planned. There is a lot of time, once you're back in business, to investigate what didn't go right. And in the heat of the moment, it, it is not wise to spend time trying to fix things forward. So we made four unsuccessful attempts that were quickly reverted. And then finally, on the fifth attempt, we were able to cut over. In the month following the first success, we extracted 54 tables to seven new database clusters. This brought the total QPSs on our main DB cluster down to 100,000. So we improved the situation by over a factor of 16. The tool quickly grew into a collection of tools. The motivation to invest in this tool was that um, we had experience from more traditional mechanisms to perform table extractions. And we knew that those required a lot of toil, a lot of changes in all the call sites where clients would be interacting with the database. Um, you would have to throw several bodies at the problem. For example, previously, we had a team of six engineers spend the best of six months to extract a single table. Inconsistencies uh, would be hard to deal with in the presence of double rights. And it would be very expensive to hold the mechanism in case of trouble. So, the engineers had such a vested interest in making progress and not going back to square one that even in the presence of an outage, they would refrain from stopping the double rights. We wanted to get to a place where we could suspend and resume the syncing of data at leisure. Um, the, the tool also grew to cover other use cases like local migrations, repacking a table in a suspendable way, um, performing heatless upgrades on a technology that our cloud vendor didn't provide a heatless manner to, to upgrade, but rather would impose at least half an hour of downtime for each major version. And finally, extracting to CRDB our North Star. 
the philosophy behind this tool was to minimize labor, to accumulate and persist in code all the wisdom that we would garner from hundreds of such operations, adding a lot of safeguards to avoid causing production issues, um, allowing for a quick revert lever to go back to the old source of truth in case any metric regressed, and essentially to perform very tricky things at the click of a button, minimizing cutover times and somewhat easing all of the anxiety that comes with production operations like these. Um, the tool would tail changes directly from information in database tables. Um, this was a must originally because we had a lot of clusters on Aurora Postgres 9.6 that had no logical replication. Even with Aurora 10, where logical replication is available, that comes at a, an extra overhead on the single primary that was already our biggest pain point. Also, if we wanted to be able to hold, suspend um, the replication during times of trouble and resume it later, we would have been at risk of the OOM killer kicking in as well as at risk of preventing the vacuum from making progress and eventually heading into transaction wraparound issues. So our mechanism um, uses polls that can be performed at any later time and can be essentially checkpointed and resumed later. We also have introduced a feedback loop to make sure that we slow down if the health of either the source or destination database is showing some cracks. We load balance reads across read replicas in Aurora or cluster nodes in Cockroach. We load balance writes onto Cockroach. And uh, we auto-tune a number of things and attempt to spread out our activity over distant ranges of the tables for two reasons. In Aurora Postgres, we don't want to gang up on sub parts of the B3 that indexes are organized around. And in Cockroach, we want to maximize the throughput by operating in parallel over different ranges. Um, we wanted to keep it simple. We had consistency issues when migrating by other mechanisms before. In this case, we decided to always, at any given point in time, have a clear source of truth, be it the old database or the new database. There is no need to capture every single change. We can just fast forward to the latest value for any row. And there is no need to even download the data to our client and then upload the data back to the destination database if we can just leverage foreign data wrappers, which is not always the case. We wanted to keep data manipulation simple and safe, and therefore, we relied on code-generated declarative SQL. For all the looping and chunking, uh, we did it through iterative algorithms. The tool would introspect the source database and generate all of the necessary scaffolding to support the migration. In particular, we had to resort to the use of some lightweight triggers to coalesce idempotent writes and uh, make sure that we captured update timestamps if the client wouldn't already provide them. And we track deletes in an outbox. The tool would also code generate infrastructure for cases where we couldn't rely on foreign data wrappers, namely a patched connection pooler that would be able to cut traffic over. Um, the runtime behavior could be customized on a case-by-case -case manner, depending on the desired data transformations, uh, changes in schema, primary keys, 
the desired constraint you wanted to perform your upsearch on. Any filtering, if you didn't want to completely forklift an entire table, but just certain specific rows. And then how you wanted to clobber data. Do you always want it to repave every single row? Did you just want to fill gaps in primary keys? Did you want to quickly just move over all the data that wouldn't violate any unique constraint and then later deal with the unique constraint violations? Or did you just want to compare and check some data on both sides uh, to verify consistency? So this is very versatile, um, especially when you're in the middle of a situation where something didn't go as you wanted and you want to safely uh, patch things up in a selective manner. Uh, speaking about schema transformations, very often you may want to switch from a sequential ID to a random UUID. Or another very useful pattern we found is to group rows that are accessed together under the same, so to speak, partition key. So that kind of trick allows um, queries that are retrieving several related rows to go to a single range rather than performing a go fish across several cluster nodes. Typically, there is a many-to-one relationship, either fairly stable or, in some cases, even ephemeral, like dashers that are waiting for orders at a given starting point. In the example here, stores that belong to the same merchant. So if the original table in Postgres um, happened to have that extra column as a foreign key, we just rely on that extra column as a prefix for the primary key in CRDB. If it wasn't present, then we add it. We don't even bother backfilling it. We just perform a reverse ATL job from Snowflake to Postgres, and we ingest a tiny lookup table that then our extract can join with to fill the missing value in. If we want a quick and easy way to chase store IDs that are missing a merchant lookup, we can finally coalesce values that are still null to a special sentinel value, say zero, and then we can easily access all of the laggard rows that we need to take care of in a single range. Very convenient. Finally, the last bit of runtime behavior, we have a single algorithm dealing with essentially exploring the entire space of a table to chunk it up and process it in parallel. That works over an integer range key, a random or circular key, like a random integer or UUID, or a timestamp that gets interpreted as a fixed point integer. Uh, the deletes are a little bit of a special case. They get captured in their own outbox. And then, when we deal with the cockroach change feeds, um, we just look at the primary keys for the affected rows, and we still fetch the latest value from cockroach itself before syncing it, instead of uh, deserializing JSON. Um, once we're done with the initial import, we need to keep going until the operator is ready to pull the trigger and cut over. Uh, in this mode of operation, we need to be careful to have some overlap between rounds to account for the delay between a write and the time the commit lands for the transaction the write belonged to. So, when we could do things with foreign data wrappers, uh, we didn't have to have the clients go through a connection pooler necessarily, and the magic would happen by forwarding the queries to the new database. 
the cutover would be just a swap from the old table to a foreign table. The revert would just be the same in reverse order. Um, if things went well, we could finally reroute the clusters to the new database. Um, we cockroach, initially we couldn't rely on foreign data wrappers, therefore we patched our connection pooler, PG Bouncer, um, to essentially be able to reroute traffic. As a trick that we could reach for if we wanted to have a hard rather than soft cutover, we would be able to suspend writes by simply redirecting all the traffic to Aurora read replicas. The red arrow is showing the data syncing. So before the operation, we're syncing data to so CRDB. Once we're all caught up, we pull the trigger. If we want, we suspend the writes for a tiny little bit, just a few seconds, and then we redirect the traffic to Cockroach. Immediately, we start syncing data back to Aurora because, once again, the rule of the game is if metrics show any cracks, revert as quickly as possible. The revert, again, is going in the opposite order. The tool keeps everybody on the same page over Slack. As you can see, in the case of the delivery table, we made two unsuccessful attempts Writes were suspended for 36 seconds in the first case and 31 seconds in the second one. As you may notice, in the first case, we reverted immediately after, so there was something that was obviously wrong with that attempt. In the second case, we waited for about 15 minutes, so um, this is a sign of progress because there wasn't any obvious crack, and uh, we only noticed something 15 minutes late. But reverting was so easy and cheap, we decided to revert and take care of that issue later. On the third attempt, we succeeded. I have a quick demo. Um, you will notice the anxiety before the operation in production and the relief at the end. OK. Uh, one minute. So I'm going to go for it uh, as soon as we're ready. OK. Fine with you? Yeah. OK. What could go wrong? I mean, it's not like the waiting is going to help things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're ready. OK. I'm going to disable the rights. It's a uh, checkpointing. All right, the checkpoint looks cool. The rights are disabled. I want to see this circle to one. All right, we can go. I'm going to give it, okay, two. Enable CRDB rights. All right, and uh, the change feed started, so we're syncing back. This is literally a lossless cutover, as far as I can tell. Like zero. Okay. Oh, amazing. Um, that's it. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions if you bump into me um, in these two days. Thank you.